Welcome to Journey at Home. I am Matt. If it's your first time tuning in, thanks so much for joining us. Hit that subscribe button for me. Hit that bell for notifications because our goal is to create content that inspires you to follow Jesus and live a better life. Now, today is episode four of our series, Who Needs Jesus? And we're going to answer this question, who needs Jesus for justice? There's a growing number of people today that would say, well, nobody does. Matter of fact, they believe religion makes it harder for people to experience justice and enjoy their rights. This love of justice and rights, by the way, it's embedded in the fabric of our country. You know that. Back in 1776, Thomas Jefferson, along with the help of John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, they penned some of the most famous words in American history. Matter of fact, I bet most of you can quote them, at least a little bit of it. Uh, he began the Declaration of Independence by writing, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that word unalienable means impossible to take away or give up. In other words, Jefferson and our founders, they believed there were certain rights you couldn't deny that all humans have and rights that should never be violated under any circumstances. And they went so far as to believe these rights were self-evident, that they were so obvious that everyone everywhere should see and recognize them. But first, what exactly are those human rights are referring to? Philosopher Nicholas Walterstorff defines them this way. He says, human rights are those that each and every human being has just by virtue of being a human being, even if they're not able to function as persons. So that's just him saying, they may be in a coma, they may have Alzheimer's, or maybe some other disability, it doesn't matter, they still have rights. And then he says, a human right is an obligation or a claim that a person has on you when she enters your presence. For example, you have the right to expect another person when they enter your presence or will not kill you, torture you, defraud you, abduct you. We could go on and on. Not because, you know, they're not going to do any of that because of your gender or your race or the contribution you make to society. In other words, just because you're a human being, you are owed and entitled to these rights. And whenever a person violates those rights, what do we call it? We call it an injustice because all of us inherently believe life should be just and fair. But that leads us to the question, well, where does that belief come from? Why do people have rights to begin with? The United Nations has a list of human rights that they say every person on the planet should have, but they do not tell us why they ought to have them. So is it just so obvious that there's no need to explain why a person has rights? Well, Jefferson and our founders, they apparently believe so. Remember, they called these rights self-evident, and they probably were at their time. In our Western culture, still to this day, they seem pretty obvious. But don't tell that to some people in non-Western cultures. Here's part of the problem. I don't have to mention the countries to you. You know who they are. But there are plenty of places in the world that strongly disagree with us on the rights that human beings should have, which means it can't be completely self-evident. We better have a compelling reason for the rights we believe in and that reason better be better than, oh, it's just obvious to everybody, right? If that is the only argument we have, then we're nothing more than modern day imperialists and colonizers enforcing our values and our viewpoint on the rest of the world. I mean, we need to have a source and a standard that is outside of ourselves on which these rights are based, on which they're founded, or we're left with no moral authority to impose them or expect them from other people. And this is why I would suggest that we need Jesus to have justice because it's impossible to have justice without the existence of an objective moral standard that applies to all people in all places at all times. I mean, what Americans think is right and just, that alone doesn't cut it. Who says we're right? Who says the rest of the world needs to listen to us if all we're sharing is our opinion on what's right and just? Human rights and justice, they have to be anchored to an objective standard that originates and stands outside of us if we want those rights to be applied equally to all of us. And Jesus taught that there is that kind of standard. He taught that all people are created in the image of God and that God has set a standard of justice that applies to every human and it never changes. Now Jefferson, the reason he called himself evident is because he believed this and he referenced this in the opening lines of the declaration. If you ask me to simplify the standard, it's simply this. The standard is the love and justice of Jesus. All human rights originate from our Creator and the love and justice He shows and says every human being deserves. 
This is the defense for why every human has equal value, dignity, and worth. It's a defense for why all humans deserve to live free. It's a basis for every human right we have. Now that may seem like a slippery slope for some of you because you equate God with injustice. You would say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. A good and loving God would remove all the pain and suffering in the world. A good and loving God would address the injustice in the world. But there, I see plenty of pain and suffering and injustice all the time. So that must mean God can't be loving or God isn't good. That would be your argument. But that is a more modern Western argument against God. Nobody in the first century thought Jesus was loving and good simply because bad things never happened to good people in the world. I mean, if the Christian faith had been that fragile, it wouldn't have survived the first 300 years because those Jesus followers, they faced extraordinary injustice. But they never stopped following Jesus because they didn't believe pain and suffering were an argument against the love of God or an argument against the goodness of God. Matter of fact, John, who was one of Jesus' closest friends, he personally observed more injustice than most of us ever will. John, he was persecuted. John was beaten, John was in prison, John watched all of his closest friends murdered for their belief in Jesus. And living in a world with that kind of injustice, John wrote these words. He said, dear friends, let's love one another, for love comes from God. Oh, wait a minute. What about all these injustices happening to you, John? What about all these injustices happening to the people who are following God? How can a loving God let that happen? And John would say, oh, that's not a reflection of God. That's a reflection of the broken sinful human nature and the broken sinful world in which we live. God's not responsible for that, humans are, because they're violating the objective standard that God has, the standard by which we're to live and treat one another. John goes on to write, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now don't miss that. John makes a really important distinction here. He says love isn't something God does. Love is who God is. If it's only something God does every now and then, then he sets us a great example, but he doesn't give us a standard. You know, I'm empathetic at times, but listen, my wife will tell you, Matt is not empathy. You don't want me to be that standard. You, you don't want me to be the thing by which every person has a right to empathy or not. But God, well, he goes beyond acting loving some of the time. He goes beyond acting loving most of the time. God is love. He embodies it. It's who he is, which makes him the objective standard to which all human rights are anchored. So if you kick God out of the room, well, then there's no such thing as injustice left because there's no such thing as an objective standard left. An objective standard of justice has to exist for injustice to exist and be seen. But you remove Jesus, and what are you left with? Well, all you're left with is biology, chemistry, and physics. And there's nothing in nature and there's nothing in natural selection that is just or loving. Anybody who believes in natural selection understands this. Natural selection does not allow for justice. Natural selection only allows for survival of the fittest. So here's the bottom line. The best way to rid the world of injustice is to rid the world of Jesus. Yeah, think about it. If you want no injustice in the world, just remove the objective standard of justice and goodness and love. You just kick Jesus out the door, then you don't have injustice anymore. But I don't actually think that's what you want because you know what you're left with. Well, you're left with my justice. I get to make my own calls. You're left with your justice. What's just for me may not be just for you, but you can't tell me I'm wrong. If I sleep with your wife, steal your truck, take your dog and inspire a country song, you can't cry injustice. There is no objective standard. And it's even worse because you kick the objective standard out the door and you're also left with Putin justice and ISIS justice and Klan justice and rich justice and street justice and majority justice and we can go on and on. My point is to reject Jesus because of injustice in the world is actually to lose the ability to define injustice entirely. So that leads me to one final question I want to ask you. If Jesus exists, does he have a solution to injustice? Because I'm looking around, I'm seeing all the pain and suffering in the world. And if he's good and he's just and he's loving, come on, he's got to have an answer for it. And the good news is, yes, he does. The bad news is we don't really like his answer. Now, people in third world countries have no problem with this answer, but we don't like it at all. But remember, just because something is unsettling doesn't make it untrue. So here's Jesus' answer. Here's the solution. The same Jesus who taught us God is love 
also taught us God will bring justice one day. This is the part we don't like because there is no justice without judgment. But we don't want a judgmental God. Don't tell me there's going to be a day of judgment in the future. A loving God couldn't possibly do that, right? But a loving God can't bring the very thing you want, justice for all, without also bringing judgment. Now, this, don't miss this, this is why the message of Jesus is so powerful. Because when God saw we used our freedom to be unjust and to be unloving towards other people, when he saw we violated the rights that God says all humans are created to have, do you know what God did? He did not send a judge. He sent a Savior. Now think about that. He sent a Savior. Jesus said it himself. He said, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Yeah, the world needs judging, and the world deserves judgment. I mean, look at all the injustice in this world. But Jesus said, that's for a future day. Right now, God's being patient. Right now, God's waiting to judge because his desire is not for you to experience his judgment. It is for you to experience his love. So Jesus says, God didn't send me to judge you. He sent me to take your judgment and then to save you from what you deserve to experience. That is why his death on a cross was necessary. He took your judgment on himself so justice would be served for your injustice. You just didn't have to serve it. He died and rose again to pay the penalty for your sins. He made it possible for you to experience the love and the forgiveness of your heavenly Father. So if you want justice in the world, if you believe every human across the planet deserves the same basic human rights that we enjoy, you need Jesus. Because a just and loving Jesus is the objective standard to which all of those rights must be anchored. If you believe in justice, then you must acknowledge you have lived unjustly yourself. And you have to acknowledge that your injustices towards others deserve judgment. So what are you going to do about that? Well, you can face your judgment and you can pay a terrible price. Or you can accept that the only one who's perfect, the only one who lived perfectly just, took all the judgment for your injustice so you don't have to. You can humble yourself. You can accept the gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers you. You can let his love guide and teach you how to love others like he loves you and how to live by the standard that he has set. So who needs Jesus for justice? I'd suggest you do, I do, we all do.